evening, Acharya Om Sadashiva Samarambham Ankara Chari Matyam Okay, so we had finished the first verse. And we will now look at the second verse. Let us first chant. Second verse of Sadhana Panchakam. Sangha Satsu Vidhiyatam Bhagavato. Sangha Satsu Vidhiyatam Bhagavato. Bhakti Dhrhadhiyatam. Bhakti Dhrhadhiyatam. Shantyadi Parichiyatam Dhrhadhiyatam. Chantyam <laughs> Tadvidvan upasrapyatam pratidinam. Tadvidvan upasrapyatam pratidinam. Tadpaduka seviatam. Tadpaduka seviatam. Ramsay kaksharam markhatam pratishiraha. Okay, so I'm just uh, muting all of you. And let us look at what the word meanings are. Sangaha Satsu Vidhiyatam. So vidhiyatam means may you be committed to that particular activity, which is what sangaha satsuhu. So satsu is to be taken as satsangaha, satpurushaha. And sangaha means the company of. So sangaha satsu vidhiyatam. Vidhiyatam should be understood as kriyatam, may you do this. So, may you seek the company of Satpurushas. Who is a Satpurusha? Who is committed to the pursuit of Jnana? And that is why he says Satsuhu. Association with the Satpurusha. Sangaha Satsuhu. May you be associated with people who are on the spiritual path. And this is very important. Because at least in the initial stages, the desire for Atma Jnana is it's quite weak. It's like a weak flame, you know. And a weak flame, if not protected, even the smallest whiff of a breeze will put it out. And therefore, it is necessary for the seekers who are in the, for the beginners to make sure that they are constantly surrounded by people who are committed <coughs> to the pursuit of Atma Jnana. Because with the company of others in the same line, your desire for Atma Jnana will also be protected. And slowly, slowly, as the value of that Atma Jnana becomes apparent to us, the flame will become stronger. And soon it will be so strong that not even a blazingly heavy wind will ever put it out. And on this way, on the spiritual path, there can be many obstacles. You will find external obstacles by way of People who are asking you why you are wasting your time, by way of family members who are asking you why don't you do something more concrete, by way of demands on your time from family members and friends, there will be many obstacles which are external. There will also be many emotional obstacles. You may find yourself coming face to face with, with 
some parts of you which are unknown to you, some negative aspects of you which are not known to you. And to face that, you should be ready. Your emotional strength should be there to understand that, yes, this is an obstacle, this is a negative tendency, I have to remove it. And sometimes if the negative tendencies are very, very strong, and especially those like lust, those like jealousy, which are not thought of well in this world, you may even be uh, find it difficult to acknowledge to yourself that I have these emotional obstacles. And therefore, these obstacles will always be there. Physical obstacles will be there, which are belonging to the external world. Emotional obstacles will be there, which are belonging to your mind. And therefore, we need to get rid of these obstacles. How to get rid of these obstacles? He says, Bhagavataha Bhakti Dhrida Adhiyatam. Adhiyatam. May you take to, may you be committed to Bhagavataha Bhakti. Bhakti for Bhagavan. And what kind of Bhakti should it be? Dhrida. Firm Bhakti. So Dhrida Bhakti can <clears throat> also be taken to mean that I have so much faith in Bhagavan that he will take care of me. Because I am a sadhaka, I am looking for moksha and therefore Bhag Bhagavan will take care of me. And Krishna says this in the Bhagavad Gita that if you are on the spiritual path, I will take care of all that you require. So there is no worry about tomorrow. That is one meaning which can be given to bhakti. Another meaning can be taken as upasana also. Because here we are talking about the various steps which the person is going to go through in a spiritual path. And therefore, after your grihastha ashrama, after brahmacharya ashrama, then there is grihastha ashrama. And the third one is vanaprastha. Vanaprastha, the predominant activity is what? Upasana. And therefore, bhakti can be taken to mean as upasana over here. And <clears throat> upasana always goes together with the ashtanga yoga. Yam, Niyam, Asan, Pranayam, Dharanam, all that goes together. So all this can be taken as the meaning of Bhakti. And this is Bhakti for Bhagavan. And who is this Bhagavan? So Bhagavan we know. What is the, what is the definition of Bhagavan? Bhaga Asya Asti Iti Bhagavan. Bhaga means those particular virtues. And what virtues does he have? He has six of them. So Aishwaryam. Jnanam, Vairagyam, Viryam, Yashas and Shri. These are the six bhagas, shad bhagas, which are said to be constituting Bhagavan. And he has these bhaga, bhagas in full measure. And that is why he is called Bhagavan. Because what does the suffix van indicate? Somebody who possesses whatever is the prefix. And therefore Bhagavan is basically a person who prefers possesses all the bhagas. And there are six bhagas. The first one is Aishwaryam. Aishwaryam is overlordship, controlling power over everything. Then Jnanam. So Jnanam can be taken as specific Jnanam or general Jnanam. Specific Jnanam meaning Bhagavan must possess the specific Jnanam of how to create the universe and the various constituents of the universe. So that specific Jnanam also he must have. And there can be general jnanam, which is that, what is what we call atma jnanam, that also he must have. General jnanam of the fact that he is everything. He is the substratum of this universe, that also he must have. So jnanam is there. Vairagyam, this passion is there in sufficient measure. And that is why we say that Bhagavan is not affected by what all goes on in the world. Even though he is intimately pervading the universe, he does not get affected by anything which goes on in the universe. And that's why very often this Bhagavan, this Atma, is take, the, the example of space is given. Space holds everything. Even the dirtiest you know, stuff in the world, it holds. The purest stuff in the world, it holds. All the contamination which takes place because of pollution, it holds. But that contamination or that pollution, it doesn't pollute the space. So that way, vairagyam is there. This passion, the, dif the distance from that which it holds. All pervading, but still not contaminated by. Then viryam. Viryam is the power. 
It is not sufficient to have jnanam, how to create the universe. It is necessary to have the, the ability, the competence also to create the universe. And that is called viryam. Yashas means the fame. As the creator, he is well known in the scriptures and well known to us also because there must be a creator because we are the created. So that is the yashas. And Sri, he contains, he is the, <coughs> he is the repository of all the wealth in the world, both spiritual as well as material wealth. So Sri also he has. So Aishwaryam, Jnanam, Vairagyam, Viryam, Yashas and Sri. These are the six bhagas, the six virtues, the six qualities which Bhagavan has. And therefore definition is bhaga, bhaga asya asti iti Bhagavan. The next word is shantiyadi parichiyatam. Shantiyadi refers to shanta etc. And shanta here refers to sama, shama. So shantiyadi refers to shamadi. So shamadi shatka sampatti. Which we all know, we saw in Tattamboda. Those six virtues, the inner wealth which we have, that is represented here. Parichiyatam. Parichiyatam means uh, the collection of, the accumulation of. And therefore here, Shantyadi Parichiyatam means you should acquire or develop these virtues starts, starting with Shanta. What is that? Shama, Dhamma, Uparati, Titiksha, Sraddha and Samadha. Shatka Sampattihi. Right? So, Shama is what? The, the ability to focus the mind, to control the mind from going in any direction, accepting where you want it to go. Dhamma is the ability to control the your, your very presence. In the presence of some you know, object of attraction, can you, can, you, can you make sure that you can walk away? So, Dhamma is not required where Shama is there because Shama is full control of the mind and if you have full control of the mind, you can sit in front of the most tempting object also and yet your mind will not fluctuate. But in the initial stages, when there is something very tempting in front of you or when is, when is, there is a situation which is very upsetting in front of you, to be able to maintain the mind without disturbance is not easy. And therefore, in the beginning, you should exercise Dhamma. Dhamma means control of the sense organs. So you can choose to move away from the source of the disturbance. That is Dhamma. Once Shama is sufficiently developed, Dhamma becomes irrelevant because you don't have to move away from any irritation or any source of distraction. Your control of the mind, Shama itself will take care of it. Then there is Uparati. Uparati is a technical meaning over here. Shama is to bring the mind to a quiet state. Uparati is to maintain that quiet state. So one is the effort at bringing and one is the effort at maintaining. And there is titiksha, forbearance or tolerance. Whenever some problems are there, you should bear up with it. The extreme heat is there, extreme cold is there. Instead of complaining, I just bear up with it. Then shraddha. Shraddha is devotion or faith. The, more, the correct explanation is faith. Shraddha in what? Shraddha in the Shruti, in the Vedas. And also Shraddha in the teacher. Because the Vedas come through you through the teacher. And therefore, Shraddha means both your faith in the teacher as the person who delivers the words of the Vedas and in the words of the Vedas themselves as being the something which cannot be questioned. And the last one is Samadhanam, the ability to keep a one-pointed mind. Chitta ekagrata is samadhan. Okay. Then what is the next one? Dhritaram karmashu tantyajata. So, here, when you say karmaha, we are talking about uh, vaidika karma. Okay. Karma which is mandated in the Vedas. So, what we call vihita karma or vaidika karma. And ashu, the term means quickly. And what does he say? So you have to break the words up. Dhritaram karmaha santyajyatam ashu. So, tyajyatam is to give up. Santyajyatam, completely give up. So, karmashu santyajyatam ashu. Quickly. Karmashu santyajyatam. Give up the karma completely. And how should you give it up? 
dhrada dharam, very firmly, your mind should be made up and you should give up karma. Then what should you do? Sad vidvan upasrapyatam. Upasrapyam is to approach. Sad vidvan here is a guru, a brahmanishta, shrotriya guru, the one who is who is uh, in the sampradaya, that means he has he himself has had a teacher and he is self-realized person also. Such a person is called Brahma Nishta Srotriyaha. Srotriyaha refers to the fact that he has heard the teaching from his teacher and therefore he is aware of the prakriyas, the various uh, ways in which you have to teach. There is a particular procedure for teaching the Vedas and that that should be that this guru should be aware of and he can be aware of only if if and only if he himself has been taught the shrotriya refers to that brahma nishta refers to the fact that he should be constantly aware that he is none other than brahman in other words he should be self realized so sadvidvan upasrapyatam after having given up the karma completely and quickly May you approach the Guru, the Jnani, in the proper manner. A Jnani is a person who is Brahmanishta Shrotriyaha, Shrotriya Brahmanishta. He knows the traditional method of teaching. So in Sanskrit, they call it Sampradaya Vit, the one who is God, the Sampradaya. Right? Why, why not just Brahmanishta? Because if he is Brahmanishta, he is of course self-realized. But if he has not gone through the teaching in this life from some guru, then he is not a sampradaya with because he doesn't know the sampradaya, the traditional method of teaching. And teaching Brahman has a particular method. And if he is not aware of that methodology, he is not a shrotriya and therefore he cannot teach you. And therefore, when you go to a guru, you should be sure that number one, he is Brahmanishta, of course, which you really cannot be sure. So, you have to take it for granted that he is a Brahmanishta. And number two, that he is a Shrotriya. He has had a teacher. Because if he has not had a teacher, he cannot teach. Okay. Now, if he is a Shrotriya and a Brahmanishta, the question might come up. If I go to him, why should he teach me? Because he has nothing to gain. So, why should he teach me at all? And therefore, he says, Pratidinam Tat Paduka Sevyatam. May you serve your Guru every day by doing Pada Puja. Pada Puja can mean worshipping his feet. And Padukas can also be taken as sandals. So the word here is used as Paduka. Paduka can be taken as the feet, can be taken as the footwear of the Guru also. Both meanings are possible. May you do that Puja every day to the Acharya. And this is very important because we saw in the 13th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Acharyo Pasadam Shaucham. That you have to serve the Guru and there only can you get knowledge. And why should you do the Pada Puja? What does Pada, how is Pada Puja done? You have to bend down to touch his feet or his sandals, right? It's a sign of humility that you are submitting to the teacher and the teaching. And by regular, regularly practicing this Pada Puja, the ego gets weakened. So this is, there is of course, Another significance to Pada Puja because it brings into being the into focus the fact that Acharya is necessary. And therefore, here Shankaracharya is telling us Shastram is accessible to us only if you've got an Acharya. Without Acharya, you can go through all the Shastrams you need, you, you can go through all the books, you can read all the books, but you will not understand, you will not get the benefit. So, Shastram and scriptures, you know, if you want to have a modern example, it can be like a DVD and the DVD player. The DVD contains the music, right? But it is available through you only through the DVD player. Both must be there. The DVD player by itself is of no use. The DVD by itself is of no use. So, you can compare the DVD to the Shastram and the DVD player to the Acharya, if both are there, then only will this be available. Therefore, to the student, the Guru himself represents the Shastram. And that is why in Tattva Bodha we saw 
ಶಾಸ್ತ್ರ ಗುರು ವಾಕ್ಯೇಶು ವಿಶ್ವಾಸ ವಾಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದಟ್ ಶ್ರದ್ಧಾ ತಪೋಬೋಧ ಡಿಫೈನ್ ಶ್ರದ್ಧಾ ಎಸ್ ಶಾಸ್ತ್ರ ಗುರು ವಾಕ್ಯೇಶು ವಿಶ್ವಾಸ ಫೇತ್ ಇನ್ ದಿ ವರ್ಡ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಶಾಸ್ತ್ರ ಆಸ್ ಕನ್ವೇಟ್ ಟು ದಿ ಗುರು ಅಂಡ್ ದೇ ಫಾರ್ ದ ಸ್ಟೂಡೆಂಟ್ ಮಸ್ಟ್ ಟ್ರಸ್ಟ್ ದಿ ಟೀಚರ್ ಆಸ್ ಮಚ್ ಆಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಮಚ್ ಆಸ್ ಇ ಟ್ರಸ್ಟ್ ದಿ ಶಾಸ್ತ್ರ ದ ಫೇತ್ ಶುಡ್ ಬಿ ದೇರ್ ಶ್ರದ್ಧಾ ಶುಡ್ ಬಿ ದೇರ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಟೀಚರ್ ಆಸ್ ಮಚ್ ಆಸ್ ಶ್ರದ್ಧಾ ಇಸ್ ದೇರ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಶಾಸ್ತ್ರ ಅಂಡ್ ವೆನ್ ಯು ಸೇ ಶ್ರದ್ಧಾ ಯು ನೋ there really is no logic so in in faith in shraddha you can't use the term logic and that is why in today's world most educated and rational people they dislike the word shraddha because it is not derived logically derived from anywhere the moment you say shraddha people think of blind faith but in our in our view shraddha can be developed through the puja etc and first of course you have to be a vedantic which means vaidika vaidika means you must trust the shastram first primarily and then through this practice of puja and going through the daily daily rituals and serving the teacher slowly slowly trust between the student and the teacher is built up until the student trust the teacher the teaching cannot take place and that is why if you read the scriptures you will find that when the student went to the teacher immediately teaching would not take place the teacher would ask him to do some work in the ashram for some time you know 6 months 8 months 1 year during that period what was the idea that the teacher would get to know and understand the student would would find out whether he has the necessary qualities whether he is an adhikari and if he is not a adhikari he can put him to karma yoga and upasana and to until such time as that adhikaritvam builds up and in this process while the teacher begins to understand the student and his and his weaknesses and strength the student begins to respect the teacher honor the teacher and have faith in the teacher once this process takes place when shraddha has developed then only teaching can take place so there is a word called shushrusha shushrusha basically is uh, is derived as shrotram ichha it is shushrusha shushrusha the shrotram ichha means the desire to hear the desire to hear the words of the shastram which means desire to learn that is the meaning of the word shushrusha but in today's interpretations it has come to mean service to the guru also and what i have just told you the methodology by which desire strengthens and faith builds up that is why it has been called as service to the guru also on the literal meaning but it is a derived by product meaning then <clears throat> the other words are brahmai brahmai kaksharam arthyatam so once this bond between the teacher and the student is established then brahma eka aksharam arthyatam arthyatam means prarthana prarthana prayer so may you ask for what brahmai ekaksharam for the knowledge about the ekaksharam brahma and <clears throat> ekaksharam is uh, can be defined as in sanskrit as ekam cha aksharam cha iti eka aksharam ekam cha that which is non dual aksharam cha that which is free from destruction so ekam cha aksharam cha means free from the limitation of space free from spatial limitations so that is one definition and the other definition of aksharam is na sharati na sharati iti aksharam that which is not subject to destruction that means free from time limitation so both ways ekam cha aksharam cha iti ek aksharam means this brahman is free from spatial limitations which means what that brahman is all pervading it is there everywhere there is no place no space where brahman is not there and that is why free from spatial limitation and nakshati it means that which is not affected by time and which is not destroyed in time and therefore free from time limitation so brahman has been defined as free from spatial and time limitations that brahman 
artyatam, you should ask for knowledge about that Brahman. And when should you ask? Once this teacher has decided that you have the necessary qualifications. And when will, when will he decide that after you have served him for some time and he has understood that your desire to learn is a genuine desire and you have done the necessary karma yoga and the upasana yoga to give you the freedom from mala and freedom from vikshepa. Basically, sadhana, chatushta, sampatti. Once that is there, then the teaching can begin. And when that happens, what does he say? Shruti shiro vakyam samakaranyatam. Shruti shiraha. So, shruti hi shiraha. The shiraha means head. Shruti means Vedas. So, this means the head of the Vedas. Vakyam. Words of the head of the Vedas. What does it mean? What does words of the head of the Vedas mean? The Upanishad. Well, yes. Basically, Vedanta. So, here head is taken as end. So, Vedanta is the head of the Vedas. So, Vedanta Vakyam is Rutishara Vakyam. So, that you should study. And how do you say that? Samakaranyatam. May you listen to that Shruti Sira Vakyam. May you listen to Vedantic words properly, with attention, systematically and for a long period of time. For a sufficiently long period of time. And what happens if you do this? You will understand the significance of Tatpada, the word Tat. And Tvampada, you should understand. And the fourth Tat, Tvam and Asi. Asipada is the is the identity between Tad and Tvam. So you should understand the full meaning of Tat and Tvampada. Once you understand that, what will you know? You will know that whatever is there, present all the time, is my essential nature. Whatever comes and goes, is my incidental nature. And what is the conclusion? Tat is equal to tam, Tvam. Because when you equate Tat, which here represents Ishvara, and Tvam, which represents Jiva, what happens? Tat is equal to consciousness plus the universal Upadis. And Tvam is equal to consciousness plus the micro Upadis. So Tat is consciousness plus macro Upadis. Tvam is consciousness plus micro Upadis. If you have to equate them, what comes and goes? The macro upadi comes and goes because the world goes into pralayam also, destruction also. So macro upadi comes and macro upadi goes. Our bodies also come and go. So the micro upadi also comes and goes. And therefore this coming and going part of it is incidental nature. What does not come in the and go is the same in the case of tatpada and pampada. And what does not come and what does not go is consciousness principle only, existence principle only, which is Satchit Ananda, Atma, it's equal to Brahman. All this is the study of the Mahavakyam. So, Sat is equal to Chit, and Chit is equal to Sat is the conclusion. So, Tat, Tvamasi means, the Sat means Chit, consciousness means existence, and existence means consciousness. So, we say Sadeva Chit, Chideva Sat. And all this is indicated by the word Tama Karnyatam. May you understand the words of the Vedanta properly. Yes, that is as far as verse number 2 is concerned. Any questions? Om Acharya Ji. Yes, please. Uh, um, is there any difference between saying Guru Seva and Guru Ke Padukao Ki Seva? No, there is no difference. Guru Seva can be any way. Paduka Seva is only a way of saying it. You can be working in the kitchen also. You can be milking the cows if it is a traditional Gurukula. Anything where you are giving service to the Gurukulam, that is Guru Seva. So, uh, often we see that uh, when we go to temples and also whether it's um, you know Adi Shankaracharya or other Gurus, we often uh, 
uh, give to them in form of you know paduka puja and uh, for other gods we often uh, say other pujas so is there any significance to it or is just a way no guru himself your whole teaching is that you are brahman obviously the guru is also brahman right so your service can be in any form normally when you think of the guru as different from yourself you will do a different type of puja when you think of the guru as equivalent to you ishwara is equivalent to you then the puja is in a different form it's in the, in the, in the form of a mental puja only okay thank you uh, i have a question uh, okay yes priti ji uh, there is a slide you can uh, quickly give up karma completely in what context is that being said sorry uh, the line it says give up karma completely Quickly give up karma completely. Yeah. What is how? What is the context there? You remember we, if you talk, if you remember the last class we talked about the total movement of the of the uh, spiritual seeker from gra from Brahmachari ashram to Grahastha ashram to yeah. Varan to Varaprastha ashram. So since yes. you are in Varaprastha, your your karma should come down, and you should be doing only those minimum karma. and remember your karma means vaidika karma okay so you should be doing minimum karma for and focus on upasana only that is why i saying you should give up karma completely but vanaprastha ashram means focus on focus on upasana and coming to sanyasa basically coming to the knowledge when you come to knowledge you are supposed to be focusing only on knowledge because the scriptures make it very clear that karma and gyanam they cannot go together and when i say karma i mean vaidika karma why is that so because any karma is dedicated to ishwara right so there is duality over there yeah. but in gyanam there is non duality and therefore basically they are incompatible karma and gyanam are in incompatible because the very basis is different the basis for karma is duality the basis for gyanam is non duality and therefore continuing karma when you are in gyanam will constantly cause a conflict in your mind so that is why it says give up karma completely focus only on gyanam thank you okay so now we can go to the next verse so we will chant वाक्याचार्यता श्रुतिशिरा पक्षश्रीयताशीयताशीयताशीयताशीयताशीयता श्रुतिमत गर्व परितेहे मुक्तिरुजता बुधजन वाद परितेजता okay so he is now briefly talking about the gyanam process shankara is entering the process of gyanam and in the first three lines he talks about three things shravanam maranam and nididhyasana so <clears throat> remember that if you use the regular sanskrit dictionary vedanta is difficult to understand you know so traditionally we <clears throat> there is a key there is a way of understanding tradition uh, vedanta which is called the mimamsa shastram and mimamsa mimamsa means the analysis 
the method of extracting the correct meaning from the Vedic words. So without this key, Vedas will appear meaningless and often very contradictory. Okay, so for example, uh, in Kaivalya Upanishad, there is there is a mantra which says, Etasma Jayate Pranaha Manas Sarvendriyanicha Amvayur Jyoti Rapaha Prithvi Vishwase Dharani which means from Brahman, all this is born. Etasma Jayate Brahm, Prana, Jayate. From Brahman, all this is born. Which is what? Pranaha, Manaha, Sarva Indriyanihi, Vayuhu, Jyotihi, Apaha, Prithvihi, Vishwasya Dharani. Entire, the Prithvi also, which is the holder of the entire universe, all this is born. And when you look at this, normally what will you think? You will find that when something is born from something else, then two things happen. When, when the mother gives birth to a child, earlier there was only the mother. Now there are two things. One is the mother and one is the child. So normally you will say, when you look at these verses, you will think that from Brahman the universe is born and therefore Brahman is also there and universe is also there. But from Imam Shastram, we come to our conclusion that Jagat, the universe is really Mithya. And therefore, there are no such things as Panchabhutas in reality. They are all Mithya only. So, there are no real two things. There is only Brahman. Jagat is Mithya and therefore cannot really be counted. And all this is analyzed through <coughs> what we call the Shad Linga. There are, there are six Lingas, six indicators for analysis of the words. And sooner or later, in one of the texts, we will do that also. But right now, if you look at the words, he says, Vakyarthaha vicharyatam. So, Vakya arthaha. The meaning of every statement, of every vakyam, vicharyatam. May you analyze the meaning, may you inquire into the meaning of every statement in the Veda. And especially, you should inquire into the Mahavakya arthaha, the meaning of the Mahavakyas. So, Vakyarthascha vicharyatam. May you inquire into and understand the meaning of all the Mahavakyas. And after that, after understanding what you do, Shrutishiraha Akshaha Samashriyatam. May you abide, may you abide by the statements of the Upanishads. Shrutishiraha, may you avoid Paksha. May you be on that side only. Pakshaha means the side. Samashriyatam. May you, may you abide only by the statements of the Upanishads. Which means Upanishads are your basic pramanam. Do not look outside into any other textbook, to any other shastra. So all this is what? This is Shravanam. All these meanings when you put together, we can put in one word, Shravanam. Then, then look at the other, other <coughs> three lines. He is introducing Mananam there. So, Mananam here means thinking about what has been learnt during Shravanam and also trying to analyze the words that you have learnt through Shravanam and also trying to understand what other systems of, of what other systems of philosophy, what, what other darshanas say and therefore negate what do you, what do you try to analyze the other darshanas for because the prime idea is to convince ourselves that the Vedantic meaning which we take from the Advaita philosophy, that is the only correct meaning. And the correct, that, that firm knowledge that the meaning I have understood is the only correct meaning can come when, when any contradictory meanings are negated. You don't dismiss them, you negate them logically. And therefore, Mananam has two parts. One is understanding what has been said properly, having no doubts in your mind. And having no doubts in your mind also means looking at similar darshanas, other darshanas, other philosophies and negating their views. Therefore, this knowledge which we are trying to acquire through Shravanam, which we have acquired through Shravanam, now needs to be processed in two steps. One is Understanding the correctness of that knowledge as the right knowledge. That is what I said. Understanding the meaning as the right meaning. And one is looking at opposing 
philosophies and seeing the errors, seeing how that knowledge of opposing philosophy is incorrect. Once these two steps have been followed, understanding the correctness of my knowledge and seeing the defects in other philosophies, talking about the same subject, then only can my knowledge set to be firm. When is my knowledge firm? When I am able to defend it in the face of any opposition. So if I am told that I am Brahman and there is no difference between Brahman and me, and say Dvaita philosophy comes and says, no, no, there is Paramatma and there is Yudjivatma, both of you are different. Or Vishishta Dvaita comes and says, okay, fine, there is Paramatma and I accept that you are also Paramatma, but you are not the whole of Paramatma, you are only partial Paramatma, you are a part of Paramatma. Vishishta Dvaita. That also I have to be able to defend against. And using all the correct logical steps as well as the Shruti Vakyam, I have to be able to defend. Once both parts are clear to me, what is the correctness of my philosophy as well as what, is, what are the problems in the other philosophy, then only is my knowledge firm. So, in there can be a number of opinions, right? There are so many darshanas. There can be multiplicity of opinions. But I should be convinced that, yes, there can be a number of opinions, but the right statement can, can only be one. Opinions can be many, one will be right, the others will be wrong. And therefore, it is wrong to say that Hinduism accepts everything. Hinduism accepts that people can have different viewpoints. We don't condemn anybody for the viewpoint. But we say there is only one right viewpoint, Brahma Satyam Jagan Mitya. And to defend that viewpoint of Brahma Satyam Jagan Mitya, it should be possible for me to be able to take on the, the arguments of any other opponent and, and demolish them. If I can do that, then only is my knowledge firm. This is the net product of Manana. So, for example, uh, Vedanta says that Jiva Jagat Ishwara is one. Okay. Vedantic teachings about Jiva Jagat and Ishwara. What are they? Yudha Jiva are infinite and immortal. Number two, Jagat is Mithya. So you are Satyam, you are infinite, you are immortal. And who are you? You are the Jiva. Jagat is Mithya. And third one is what? Jiva, Brahma and Paraha. You and Ishwara are not different. Right? So the Lord is omniscient and you are the not different from the Lord is omniscient. And very often it is difficult for me to accept this. You know, very often I don't even know the spelling of omniscient. Forget about the fact that the Lord is omniscient and I am omniscient. And what do other darshanas tell you? They tell you that you are the miserable jiva and there is an Ishwara who is protecting you. And that is easier to believe. It's easier to believe that I am a miserable jiva who is living in this world, which is troubling me constantly. And therefore I require the protection of Ishwara. That is easy to believe. But Vedanta is not saying that. Vedanta is saying, you jiva are infinite. Brahma satyam. Jagan mithya. Jiva brahman apara. You and Ishwara are not, not different. And all other systems, remember, they claim that they are Tarka Pradhana Shastram. They are based on logic only. And this is very appealing. Right? When somebody says that, oh, you are talking only about Shruti, but you know, Shruti doesn't you know, give you any proof. It just says things and you have to accept. But I am giving you logic. So all the other darshanas, Dvaita system, Advaita system, uh, Vishishta Advaita system, all of them are heavily logic based. But we Vedantics are Shruti Pradhanam. And for us, logic, Taraka is a supporting discipline only. And that is why for us, Shraddha becomes very important. And therefore, a thorough analysis of all the other systems in relation to the teachings of our system, the ability to refute and demolish their arguments, this is an essential component of, of Maranam. And when we study other systems, we cannot use only Shruti. In fact, because other systems rely predominantly upon logic, upon Tarka, to refute them on their grounds, what do you need? You have to use logic. Because you cannot say that 
I don't agree with you on you are giving a logical statement. I don't agree with you because Vedanta, the Veda or the Upanishad gives a statement which is contradictory. So that is not acceptable to the other systems because for them, Shruti is subsidiary and logic is primary. For us, it is the other way around. Shruti is primary and logic is subsidiary. And therefore, if we have to be able to find them on their grounds, we should not only be strong in Shruti, we should be strong in logic also. In fact, there is a whole chapter in the Brahma Sutras where Shankara proves that logic is logic alone. I am not saying only logic. That logic alone is not competent to reveal the truth. And he gives a number of examples to show the deficiency of the logic. He, he points out how logic has limitations. And then he says, Shruti is also sealed. Sankara, how, how does he approach? He takes the logical systems and says, this is the defect in your logic. And finally ends up by saying that, Shruti also says the same thing, Naisha Targena, by logic alone, Atma cannot be understood. Katho Upanishad. So he quotes from there. But before that, he uses logic to establish. And this kind of a refutation, meeting them on their own grounds, on their own strengths with logic, refuting their logic, and then saying that, okay, Shruti also refutes. Not only have I refuted you logically, I can refute you from Shruti's point of view also, even though you do not believe in Shruti, but Shruti says the same things. This kind of a argument is called Mananam. And therefore, he says here, Dus, dus Tarka Suviramyatam. May you totally withdraw from Dus Tarka. Dus Tarka, dus tarka means wrong logic. Tarka is logic. Dus Tarka is wrong logic. So, may you totally withdraw from wrong, wrong logic, which means may you use your logical abilities to prove that the statements made by other darshanas saying that they are logical, you have to prove them illogical. So you have to use logic to prove that their logical statements are not logical. This is also marana. And after that, what should you do? Shruti mataha tarkaha anusandhiyata. Shruti mataha tarkaha is different from dus tarkaha. Dustarka is basically wrong logic and in this connection you can take it as the approach to the philosophy of by other darshanas where logic is primary and shruti is secondary. That is what is called dustarka. And here we are saying shruti mataha tarkaha that is law where shruti is primary and logic is only supporting. What should you do? Anusandhiyatam. May you repeatedly remember that logic which is supporting the Shruti. Support the Shruti, Shruti statements. So use logic as a tool to extract the meanings of the Shruti Vakyam. Meanings of the Shastram. But do not use logic to put forward a new philosophy. Because you will find when you Examine the darshanas which are contra, which are contra darshanas, that is, other, other, other darshanas other than Advaitam, you will find that they use logic basically as the foundation stone of their philosophy itself. They are not basing their, their uh, whole philosophy on the Shruti. That is a big difference. Logic is used to propound the philosophy, to put forward a philosophy, and then they try to use Shruti to back up those statements. While for us, Shruti is primary because we are Vaidikas. So our philosophy is based on Shruti words and we use logic to extract the meaning from the words and say that this is what Shruti really means. And once I am convinced through Mananam, then, you know, I don't really care whether other people accept Vedanta or not. But this mananam, I have to be really convinced. That's why I am saying proper mananam means examining the views of other darshanas also. Because sometimes those views are so logical that they can shake even advanced Vedantics. And you should be therefore be able to see through that logic, see the defects in that logic, put forward those arguments, demolish that logic, 
and then say now having demolished that logic the only explanation which is left is that of my shruti and therefore i accept that and then i use logic myself but putting shruti first i put the vedanta vakyam first then i use logic to extract the correct meaning so i don't really care now whether other people accept vedanta or not and when i say i am brahman i don't need to cross check with anybody so i am brahma asmi is no longer a shruti vakyam for me it is knowledge it is the conviction that yes i am brahman it's like when somebody calls me a donkey you know if some person comes and say you are a donkey do i turn around and check whether i have grown a tail or not no right therefore that kind of conviction i am when you say i am brahman with that kind of conviction you don't need to check at all from anybody that is the knowledge which we call samshaya rahita gnanam knowledge free of all doubts and that is the end result of the maranam process then comes what then comes the nididhyasanam process what happens in nididhyasanam the knowledge which is now with free of doubts it gets converted into psychological strength into emotional strength why because the root is ignorance right purely at the intellectual level this ignorance and even though when you when you when you say that you don't know that you are brahman what is it it is basically ignorance only ignorance of the fact that you are brahman so the moolam the root problem is what the root problem is ignorance only agnyanam only and this agnyanam resides where where is the locus the agnyanam locus is at the intellectual level then what is the problem even though the uh, the agnyanam is located in the intellect the problem is that the products of agnyanam the symptoms of agnyanam appear where they appear in the mind as raga dvesha kama krodha so the intellectual problem of ignorance is converted into emotional problem of raga dvesha kama krodha loba etc and therefore intellectual problem of ignorance gets converted into the psychological level and therefore the solution has to be twofold at the intellectual problem the agnyanam should go and not only that at the emotional level at the psychological level the psychological problem should also need to be pulled out and thrown out and if the emotional issues have not been sorted out even if the agnyanam has been has been you know removed at the intellectual level the gnanam is superficial because it has not become deep rooted and therefore there needs to be the assimilation of the teaching that knowledge which is at the intellectual level what is that knowledge i am brahman that knowledge requires a conversion into the psychological level that knowledge has to become emotional strength and once the knowledge becomes emotional strength that is jivan mukti hi and that is how krishna described the gnani if you remember verse number 56 of chapter 2 of the gita dukheshvanu digna manaha sukheshu vigata spraha vitaragam bhaya krodah tatar dhir munir uchyate the benefit is always at the emotional level so when you eat for example this happens in other processes also when you eat food assimilation is a natural process but when you acquire atma gnanam to convert that it require into emotional strength it requires huge amount of work and it's very often a lifetime job and sometimes that job spans across various lifetimes you may become a gnani in this birth but if the effort has not been sufficient or if your prarabdha karma is not supporting <clears throat> it may not get assimilated so in your next life you will start with the gnanam but you will continue working for the assimilation so i how do i do this job in nidhi dhyasanam i have to start with my small problems and slowly slowly work myself up the ladder addressing all my weaknesses one by one and therefore i should be constantly alert and why should i be alert 
because in daily transactions i have to keep observing which are the weaknesses which are surfacing in my mind and i have to alert i have to address them during my daily nididhyasana and this is what is being said here in this verse <coughs> brahmai vasmi vibhavyatam <coughs> vibhavyatam means to meditate or contemplate or to think about so vibhavyatam may you meditate upon the teaching brahma asmi that i am brahman and together with that what should i do aham dehaha matihi the idea that i am the body aham dehaha matihi matihi means the thought or the idea aham dehaha i am the body what should happen ujjhayatam should be given up instantly i must be able to see my body so right now i say i am the body but i must be able to reduce my body to one of the objects of the world i must become objective and therefore i must see that my body is also one of the objects of the world which means i must lose attachment to that body i must be as objective about my body as i will be about the bodies of other people and what should be what should be the frequency of meditation he says ahara ahaha so ahaha ahaha daily repeatedly this should be done what should be done shankara gives general instructions garva parityajyatam give up pride no arrogance should be allowed to surface remember that there can be vidya garvam also there can be arrogance about having the knowledge that i am a great scholar i know all the vedas i know all the upanishads that also should be strictly guarded against why because what does gnanam do gnanam is supposed to remove all arrogance right arrogance comes of what our about the of the attachment to the i the rc the moment you say i i am the rc i know this i know that you are talking about the lower i and gnanam is supposed to remove the identification with the lower i therefore gnanam is supposed to re- remove all arrogance but if the gnanam itself produces pride then there is a big problem and therefore shankara says garva parityajyatam give up that pride completely and buddha janaihi vadaha parityajyatam so buddha janaihi vadaha means arguments with gnanis you should never argue with the gnani you should say that gnani is the person who is i can learn from so arguments can boost my ego <clears throat> and remember that if you enter into an argument with a person who is a wise person the gnani the gnani will never enter into the argument he will just back off unless you are the teach unless the gnani is your teacher and you are asking properly you will find that gnani will not enter into a argument with you so what will happen is you will lose the opportunity of learning and therefore here it is important to understand the difference between the words vada and samavada so vada is what vada is a conversation between equals so i look upon the other person as a equal and therefore i already have a conclusion and i want to prove the con- my conclusion is correct and i want to refute the view of the other person so that is vada in samavada what happens i look up on the teacher as higher in status to me wiser than me and you can see this in the language itself so many in the entire bhagavad gita begins with questions you will see in many of the upanishads that the question itself begins with a mark of respect when the student addresses the teacher as hey bhagavan so in samavada unlike in the vada in samavada i may have my own opinions but i have not reached a conclusion because i have come to the teacher to learn my aim is to learn therefore my mind is open but in vada i don't have uh intention of learning my intention is intention is only to refute the views of others so in vada i talk more and i listen less in samavada my words are limited to the questions and i listen more so whenever you find that when somebody is teaching you you are thinking of the next argument which you can make remember that you are in the vada mode you are not in the samavada mode 
In some other mode, when the teacher talks, you listen. And your questions are therefore, your words coming out from your mouth are basically only questions and you listen more. And what is more, if you are not convinced by the teacher's answer, you will say, I will think about it and you will not argue at that point of time. You will give sufficient time to try to understand the teaching. And then after some time, if you are not convinced, you will raise the doubt. And again, the same process goes on. So there is always a conclusion, always an end to the vada, I mean, to the samavada. However, in vada, the argument goes on and on. Therefore, samavada is okay, but vada should be given up. And that is what he is saying here. He says, Bhudhajanaihi, with wise people, vadaha paritejata. Never enter into an argument with wise people. So with this we will stop. Any questions? Okay. So thank you for your patience. With this, we we'll close. Om Purna Pada Purna Meda Purna Purna Dachate Purna Sya Purna Madaya Purna Eva Rishabhishate Om Shanti 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 Om Tatsat Om Namah Shivaya Thank you Thank you Thank you so much